yeah okay. cool so thank you for coming over tanner i really appreciate your time i have uh, been following you and then your facebook retargeting ads are following me <laughs> after visiting your website so yeah tell us a little bit about who's tanner larson looks like your name is very nordic by the way yes I, i'm swedish uh, half swedish According to my family, I'm half Swedish, half Texan, because my mom says Texas is his own country. So, But yeah, so for me, I'm basically a glorified window cleaner. That's what I started out as. That was my, my first career. I started a window cleaning business. And then I actually had an eye surgery, a cornea transplant that kept me from working. And I had to, so I sold my business and then I transitioned online. And that was when I kind of found out that the internet was not this magical place to make money that it had to be treated like a real business. Cause when I built my window cleaning business, it's a real business. Like you had to market, you had to do all this stuff. You had to have finances, accounting and all this stuff. But on the internet, everybody always seemed, and this is back in 2001, by the way, people talked about how it was just easy to make money. And then I tried to make money and I held my breath and I didn't make any money. And I realized that I had to become a student of, of business again, all over online because the internet's just a different medium. But um, I got into eBay early on in 2001, started selling physical products on eBay, became a, a power seller, I was selling $20,000, $30,000 a month or more, uh, up to $100,000 a month on eBay. It was great, except for the technology wasn't there. So my, my warehouse was my house. My, I, had, I spent four to five hours a day at the post office individually weighing packages because you couldn't print shipping costs and stuff like that. You'd have to copy and print the label out of PayPal onto the thing, and it was a nightmare. So... I quit doing physical products and transitioned into selling digital products because I thought, oh my gosh, I don't have to send it. I can just buy, sell it. It's amazing. I found ClickBank and I created a digital product on how to start a window cleaning business and a whole bunch of other stuff and realized that that had its own drawbacks and challenges. And I had to learn about sales funnels and direct response copy and sales copywriting and all that stuff. And uh, still love physical products for just the sale of things. But until technology caught up, I didn't really get back into physical products. So as technology caught up and all of a sudden you could print shipping labels and you could have fulfillment and all these different things, I started dabbling with physical products again. And at that time I was very good at funnels and sales copy and optimization of strategies in terms of getting people to buy my stuff. So I just kind of married physical products with direct response marketing, which at the time was kind of unheard of. Very few people were doing that. It was kind of like you were either an e-com store owner or you were a funnel information marketing guy. There was no marrying of the two and it worked really, really well. And then I just kind of continued on doing both for a long time. And that led to build, grow, scale and the kitchen brands and a lot of other stuff that we're going to talk about today. So I'm not sure if there's yeah. anything else you want. Yeah. yeah. That transition really well into the kitchen stories. So what is all about? The kitchen brand? Yeah. So. Let's see, how, how do we want to start this? So during, uh, up, I, was, I was on Amazon FBA. I was doing a lot of, um, when FBA program got popular, I jumped on there early on and I started selling a ton of stuff on Amazon FBA. And a Amazon's great. The problem with Amazon is that it's not a business for you, right? You don't own the customer, you don't own the journey, you don't own the data, and am you're basically building your palace, if you will, in someone else's backyard. and Amazon actually stole one of my products, which they're known to do. They've actually bought my manufacturer from and, and took my product and started selling it themselves and locked me out. And it was when that happened that I saw some other friends of mine having the same issues. I was like, you know what? I gotta, I, I'm breaking my own rules of business. Like I'm not following what I believe, which is own the customer, own the data, own the order process and everything. So at that point, I jumped, I was already doing funnels as well, but I was like, I have too many products for this kitchen brand for these. I had a second amendment brand as well. I need to get into the stores again. So we set up a store, we got on Shopify. This was really my first experience with Shopify. Before that I'd done Yahoo stores and I mean, old antiquated technology type, type platforms. And then Shopify was kind of a breath of fresh air because it was very user-friendly, but, and it was early on, it started working really well. So. The, we found this, this kitchen brand specifically, this is the interesting story, is kind of fell bass backwards into this. We found the products through some friends of ours who wanted to partner with us. They had been selling it, but didn't know how to build a brand. 
And they said, hey, why don't you partner with us? And I'm like, they were drop shipping it. And I'm like, well, we have to do an inventory-based business. If we're going to do this, we've got to do it right. So we ordered inventory. And then when the inventory showed up, the partners bailed because they didn't want to pay for part of the inventory. So they left me um, by myself at the time with this massive amount of inventory, an unbuilt store, and just not knowing what to do at, the, at that point. And my now business partner, Matt Stafford, was kind of involved in that too. And he's like, well, oh, man, we got to figure this out. You're stuck with all this inventory, like hundreds of thousands of dollars of inventory, which I had paid for personally because nobody else chipped in. Right. So Matt actually moved to Reno to help me and we worked together on the store and uh, we got the store set up, got it optimized a little bit. What we thought was optimized based on what we knew at the time. And it started selling. Matt was really good at Facebook ads and we started selling really well. This was uh, 2016, uh, 20, 20, end of 2015, 2016. Ads were a lot easier back then and everything. And so we had a store, which by today's standards, you guys would puke if you saw that store. But but at that time, it was fine. And we started selling. We started selling really well. Went from hundreds of units a day to thousands of units a day, making hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. And it was amazing. And then Facebook changed. I don't know if anybody else has ever had Facebook change on them, but it changed for us. And all of a sudden, <laughs> it started going like this. And we went from making thousands of sales a day back down to hundreds of sales a day. And the profitability just kept dropping and then we're like, oh, crap, what do we do? So we kept adding apps and trying new things and putting more stuff on the store and trying to get better CPAs and better CPMs and just throwing crap at the wall to see what would stick at that point. And over this period, we just we went from selling thousands and thousands of units a day, and we had our own fulfillment warehouse, too. So we were pickpacking and shipping, and everything was going out every day. We would have inventory, an entire container load of inventory come in. We unload it. And it would go out the same day in, in orders. We were selling so many good containers coming in almost every day, and it was awesome until it wasn't when the ads changed. And when ads changed, we, we thought, okay, well, we just got to – we need to add another app, an upsell app. We need to do this. We need to go to a manual bidding. We need to – basically all the stuff that everybody throws at the wall trying to figure out what works. And while we're doing this over this period, we started going negative like we were selling because we had so much inventory pre-ordered coming in that i mean we had half a million dollars worth of inventory at any given time either in production on the water or in the where the warehouse but that was coming but then sales start dropping but you still have to pay for the inventory right so very quickly i'm writing you know huge checks every single month just to cover the cost of operating a business that was not profitable and it was it was it was stressful. It was, I mean, we, Matt and I didn't know what to do. We, we were mad at each other. We were mad at the world. I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a pleasant husband. I wasn't a pleasant father because we were stressed out. Like I was literally every money, penny that was coming out of my personal account was just going to feed a business that we couldn't survive, couldn't, couldn't make work. And all the things that everybody was telling us to do, the gurus of the time and the experts and everything else, none of it was working. And so we kept going and struggling and struggling to Matt started looking at, he saw somewhere on something, like, give me, back this up, guys. In terms of how idiotic we were in terms of not knowing at this time, Matt, one of his favorite stories is, he didn't know what a cache was. So he had, he, his, to him, the site loaded really fast. And one of our web developer friends came over and said, dude, your site's slow. It takes like 16 or 18 seconds to load. Matt's like, no, it doesn't. Loads fast for me. Look, look, look. And he's like, no, there's this thing called cache which makes it load fast for you, but for the rest of the world, it loads really slow. Like, it had no concept of that at the time. And so that conversation led into this thing about data and using Google Analytics in its infancy, which nobody was doing, nobody was talking about at that time. I'm sure people were doing it, but nobody talked about it. You never heard an e-commerce guru or marketer say, manage your data, look at your Google Analytics, or even how to set it up. So we got it set up and we started looking at it and that was when we started having our, our major epiphany. We realized that from the data, the traffic's not the problem. We're getting the traffic. Yes, traffic changed, but what, what the real reality was is that the market evolved, the traffic's changed, yes, but the problem was we weren't starving. Like, we were getting traffic. We were dying of indigestion. We couldn't digest the traffic we were getting, right? And the data was showing us this, and we found things like browser segments and device types and all these things, and we realized, 
our best conversions were on Android devices, but our Apple iOS devices were converting at a third of what our Android devices were. I wonder why that is. So we dug into the data, looked at the site, figured that out, learned how to fix little things, and all of a sudden got our iOS conversions to match our Android conversions. Boom. All of a sudden, we're trying to make, make money again. And we start doing little things like that, little tweaks. They start making really, really big impacts. And we go from selling tens of units at that point a day back to hundreds, back to thousands. And then we got all cocky. And guess what? Facebook changed again. And then it dipped again. It was this big, constant yo-yo cycle. But that, at that point, we're like, okay, let's look at the data, keep looking at the data. And we just kind of kept plugging away at it. Now, where we were back then and where we are today are completely different. But during this process, we learned, this was the big epiphany for us, and it's what led to Build, Grow, Scale, and everything else, was that traffic is not the problem. Traffic is abundant. The problem is what happens after the ad click, right? Once they land on your site, your site is the problem, and that was our problem, right? It was it, this, the buyer's journey was not optimized. It was not clean. It was not streamlined. We, were, we had built a store from the perspective of a seller, and not caring about what the customer journey looked like and not making that optimization path as smooth as possible to increase conversions. If you do that, you can digest any traffic. The problem was, at that time, we had no concept of what optimization, conversion rate optimization, what we now call revenue optimization was. And it was just when we started getting into that data, that's when things started to change, and that's when the store really took off. And from that point on, it's been like – an amazing like hockey stick growth thing. And as we were doing that, people, our, our friends who had stores were like, hey, this store was failing. Like you guys were sucking, but you're crushing it now. How'd you do that? And we said, oh, we're doing this. And we're like, oh, can you look at our store? So we looked at their store. We helped one of our friends, Drew Canoli with Organifi. They, had a, they were a funnel-based business, but they had a store that uh, got type in traffic and kind of follow up traffic, but no, no, no marketing directed to it. And it was stuck at about $2 million a year. And in 90 days, we were able to get it from $2.5 million a year to an $8.7 million run rate doing that. And then so that was, like, okay, this is, works not just for us. And then we had another friend ask us to work on their store, which was a jewelry store. Did the, and it was like, actually not jewelry, but sunglass, like accessories that danglies that hang off your sunglasses. Did the same thing for them. Then another store, a print-on-demand store, they said, hey, can you help us? They were at three hundred dollars a month. And over the next seven months, we took them to 2.7 and then to 3.7 million a month using just the data stuff. No more 27 apps. No more getting magical at traffic. Because people who are running traffic, typically the algorithms are good. Like they're, You're probably better at traffic than you need to be, and we were. But we were thinking that traffic was the one thing we had to get better at, and it wasn't. It was the on the store. But if it wasn't for that kitchen store giving us that massive yo-yo-y type of, of path. And, I mean, it was some scary lows. Like, we were wondering if we were going to be able to keep the lights on at times. I was wondering if I was going to lose my house. Like, I'd done really well over the years, and I had I made a lot of money prior to all this, but almost all the money that I had had gone back into trying to keep the business afloat at that time. And I was like, man, am I, did I just screw my family's future up? You know, but we, we stuck with it, and we continued working through it. And ultimately, we stumbled across very slowly and very probably with more problems than someone who was smarter than us would have because we're not the brightest. Like I'm a window cleaner. My business partner, Matt, was a concrete guy. So we're not exactly like we're, we're laborers, right? We're not high tech guys, but we turned it into what we now call revenue optimization. Yeah. Can you, can you give us some understanding what is revenue optimization sure. and how is it different from CRO stuff? Absolutely. So conversion rate optimization is great. Now that, that, and that's the pioneering model that basically started where we, where we got going. What we, now with conversion rate optimization, typically, obviously there's other aspects to it, but it's very focused on conversion rate, right? And maximizing conversion rate. Well, one of the downsides of conversion rate optimization that we find is that it gives people tunnel vision to where they focus on very narrow minded metrics and sometimes vanity metrics and things that don't take in the entire scope of the business. Over the years, we've learned that a more holistic approach to optimization actually performs better and generates bigger wins over the long term. Because our, our focus with revenue optimization, it's this holistic approach to optimizing your entire buyer's journey from the time the click lands on the site to any way they portray their, or move through the site to when they leave into the back end or if they bounce and you, you 
basically optimize the entire process. So in that case, revenue per user is one of our key metrics that we really, really care about. And like conversion rate, it's a conversion rate's truly a vanity metric. Like it's important, but I can I can crush your conversion rate. You want to get a bigger conversion rate? Let me cut your your product by ninety percent in price. You're going to get a bigger conversion rate. But did you make more money? No. Now I know that's a dramatic example, but it's you know it's it's reality there. You can you can manipulate that metric and still have worse effects on your store. Another example of that where we where revenue optimization comes in is with average order value. Some CRO guys talk a lot about average order value. Other guys talk not very much about it. Obviously, everybody knows it's important, but from a traditional CRO standpoint, you, you, want, you, you install an app on your Shopify store in the cart, a cart booster app that adds a little checkbox order bump inside the cart to say, hey, you bought the sunglasses. Would you like the hard case that goes with them, right? And then on your Shopify dashboard, you see your average order value and you see the little green arrow saying, oh, yeah, up 5%. Yes. My AOV went up, but what you don't know is that typically, especially in the cart, just because it shows, shows an increase in your AOV doesn't mean you don't have a decrease in some other key metric, right? And Shopify dashboards won't tell you that. Your app dashboards won't tell you that. The only way to find that is if you know if you have Google Analytics set up correctly and you know how to use it. And what we found, and this has been over up to this point hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of sales results from ourselves, our clients, and everything else. And that specific example, an AOV boosting app in the cart, typically, yes, it does increase your AOV, but it also re reduces reach checkout and conversions. So while you're making more money from your AOV, the drop in the other two key metrics actually means you're making less money and, and getting less customers than you would have if you didn't have that app, right? So... That kind of tracking is where we look at that holistic approach to optimization to make sure we're tracking everything. And it's a customer-centric approach, which is kind of, again, counterintuitive to a lot of traditional CRO. It's, we, we believe that clarity trumps persuasion, okay? A lot of the, the CRO stuff that we started with as well was very heavy on persuasion, tactics, things like that shaky add to cart buttons or countdown timers and things like that, which, or even that, like the proof element that pops up on your screen, right? That says, say so-and-so bought. That was great when it came out. The problem is all the, the shady dropship sellers, like the bad ones, not the good dropship sellers, but all the shady sites used it too to make themselves look more r realistic. And now the market knows that's BS. And it's actually a sign of distrust when people see that now. They don't trust it. They don't trust the site. So... Going through that whole process is what revenue optimization is all about. And it's the, the focus that we say at Build, Grow, Scale is you don't need to be better at traffic. Traffic is not your problem. Everybody thinks that traffic's your problem. It's what people sell you because it's sexy. It's easy. The reality is, is the optimization side is where your true problem is. The traffic is this, the symptom, right? The, and the real root problem is that your store more than likely sucks. And I can say that because my store has sucked, my other stores have sucked, my friend's stores have sucked. And they, because you're naturally, you don't know how to leverage that. You look at your store and you, you see it a certain way. The user doesn't see it that way. That's why user testing is so valuable, right? And optimizing that journey makes all the difference. It, it will take a store. Now, the, actually, we should talk about iOS for real quick because this will tie in. Because iOS 14 happened. All these stores that were making money now aren't making money because, and, and they're blaming it on iOS 14. Yeah, yes, it has some effect. But the reality is, is that just like to us, when our store was converting before in 2016 and 17, and then all of a sudden it wasn't, it wasn't that it wasn't the traffic's fault. It was that traffic got more expensive, which, it, which happens every year. It goes up 30% on average every year. The market evolved. But the reality is, is the problem was our store. If our store had been optimized from the get-go, we would, we would still be fine. What the problem was, it was so much easier back then, and pre-iOS, it was so much easier. There was, they're allowed for slop. You were allowed to be sloppy with your store, sloppy with your sales process, and still eke out a marginable profit and everything else. Now, the, the market's getting more competitive. It's just getting tightening up. So the, that slop, the ability to have that much sloppiness in your brand is just disappearing. And people aren't realizing that. And they're thinking, oh, my gosh, I need this new tracking script or I need this new thing. Yes, that can help. But you're still 
putting a band aid. It's like tre treating a bacterial infection with a band aid. It's not going to make it better. You're band aiding the problem when you actually need to cure it. As you are you saying so much valuable stuff, I'm just writing it down so fast. <laughs> Later on, I can make the podcast uh, out of it. So that's why I'm, I'm looking at my screen. Yeah, no worries. So insightful. So if you have to summarize your lessons, what you've learned with optimizing your stores mm -hmm. and, and the story and uh, the iOS, what are the three things that any e-commerce um, merchant or founder should mm -hmm. know to actually understand, okay, like, okay, I, I understood the story, but what is the key thing you're trying to tell me? Yep. Okay. So number one iOS 14 sucks. It, it's a bummer that it happened, but it's reality now. So we need to just move on with it and get past it. But iOS is not the problem, right? It, it's going to continue to happen. Things like that are going to continue to happen. So iOS is not the problem. And also finding a tracking script like Hyros or Wicked Reports or any of these other ones, that doesn't solve the problem either. Yes, it helps you get more data on your stuff but it doesn't get the data into the ad manager where it actually needs to be to help the algorithm. The only thing that's going to help that is using the conversion API with Shopify back and forth with Facebook. That's the closest thing you're going to get. Yes, use, we use Hyros. We love it. But it doesn't solve the problem. And all the, those marketers are capitalizing on it, trying to sell you on that, but just realize that it's not going to solve your problem. It does give you some more insight into your, your sales, but it doesn't put those sales and that data into the ad manager where it's actually going to be impactful to you. So it's not going to change how your ad, your advertising works. Next, stop focusing on traffic. That's what we focused on. We thought, because that's what everybody says to focus on. You buy an e-com course and 99% of it is traffic, 2% picking products, 1% building your store. Like it's, it's just, and that didn't add up to a hundred. I know I, math's not my strong suit, right? That it's just, Give traffic a break. Like, yes, you'd be good at it. You're probably already better at it than you need to be. Focus instead on what happens after that click gets on your site. Start looking at all your metrics. Are your, is your add to cart low? Is your reach checkout low? Is your conversion percentage low? Is your AOV low? Maximize those things, and then traffic will start working better. And then the final thing that I would say to any store that they can get, get started with right away is start leveraging data, like even at the smallest level. And when I say start leveraging data, we work with thousands of stores a, a year uh, through our coaching programs, through our events, through our whatever, our done-for-you services. 90% of these stores that come in, they're like, yeah, I've got Google Analytics. And what they mean by that is they signed up for a Google Analytics account, they copied their code or their little tag, and they pasted it into their Shopify store or their WooCommerce store or whatever, and that's it. They don't know how to log in. They don't know how to access it. They don't know what it does. They've never turned on enhanced e-commerce tracking, so they're not actually using it. And that's only the basic, like Google Analytics is an intense platform. It's not user-friendly, it's very complicated, and then tying it in with Tag Manager, which needs to happen, is hard. Google Analytics Academy is free. Google puts it on. It's not e-com specific, but it'll give you a good foundation in, in analytics. I would recommend everybody take that. And then if you can't do it yourself, it is worth the money to pay someone who knows Google Analytics correctly, knows how to set it up on a store, and pay them to do it for you and then have them teach you how to start leveraging your data because all the biggest wins, the low hanging fruit that will make your store profitable are in that data. So I have this sponsor who is actually alternative to Google Analytics called Uribe. I don't know if you've heard about them. Have you heard yeah, about Yeah, we have. Them? We're actually testing that one right now. Yeah, we have, a, we have one of our stores on it. That's So yeah, it, I, I, they look interesting. We just, most of our stuff is all Google Analytics, but when some, one of our guys brought it to us and we're like, yeah, let's test it out. Cool, cool, good to know. So, so basically what I'm learning from you is that guys, all the merchants who are there, they have not set up their Google Analytics really well. They are not leveraging the data and just leveraging the data to just understand where the drop-off is happening. Go fix it so that you can actually make more money. Correct? And that, exactly. And you want, like, if you have Google Analytics and Tag Manager set up on your site, you want all that ad data that you don't think you have, it's in your Google Analytics. Like, if you're using UTMs on your ads, all that data will populate through. And you, the other thing is, ad sets that you think are failing, according to the Facebook or Google Ad Manager, might actually 
based on a different ROI date, like a 60 day ROI or whatever might actually be very profitable. But your only way to know that is through Google Analytics where it'll say, hey, on Facebook that says this ad account or this ad set is losing, but in reality by on day 60, this ad set is actually massively profitable. So you would turn it off even though you should have left it on. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So, it happened with us as well, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's massive how important it is. And it's, but the data does you no good if you don't learn how to, to use it. And it's not, it's not rocket science. It takes some effort and takes some work and everything. But, and, but if you want to build a brand in today's competitive marketplace, you want to build an e-com store that's going to last for a long term, you can't do it. You can't scale it, which everybody cares about. Nobody wants to build or grow. They want to just do half the build and then jump to scale. Right, you can't do that. But if that's what they want to do, if you want to get to that scale thing, you're never going to get there without data. Yeah. So I've heard these really good ecom D two C brands are using Amplitude Heap um, as well. What's your opinion about that? Yeah, those are those are great. The more data you can have, the, the one downside to those, not those platforms in particular, but using too many data pieces, is that is the effect on your store. Like they can slow them down significantly. So like Hotjar, Lucky Orange, and now we're using also using Clarity. Clarity is looking to be pretty interesting. Hotjar and Lucky Orange are great. They offer you know screen recording, uh, session recording, which is massively powerful. Heat mapping, you can do on-site polls, all kinds of stuff with that, and they're great. But they can actually dramatically drag down your site and your site speed, which means your performance suffers. So it's better to have those things on and off as you need them. So that would be mm -hmm. my only thing there is just Got it. monitor how much, how many of them you stack on there at one time and what, it. what effect it has on your speed. Cool. cool. Well, thank you for the story. I, I'm pretty sure a lot of marketers would appreciate this simple learning from you. We move into rapid fire round. And so the first one is, is there any growth marketer that, that you admire who you admire? Oh. I, gotta say, I, I love what Josh Elites is doing with snow. I love what Josh is doing with snow. Just it's, it's a different approach to business and it's, he's actually doing all the, now he's doing retail and everything else. I just, I love what he's done with that brand. There's a couple other guys that are really, really awesome too, but in terms of make like really taking a brand to where everybody wants it to go. He's doing that right now. Great. What's the one bad piece of advice you've ever got? Bad piece of advice. And don't say traffic. Yeah, no, a different one. One of the one of the worst pieces of advice I got was that you didn't need a store in a business, and I I, I bought into that and I believed it and I I, I practiced it for years. But if you're going to build a traditional e-commerce brand, funnels are great and I love them. We still use them, but it's a, it's a combination of funnel and store. New customers, great funnels are great for acquisition. Repeat customers. No one wants to go through a funnel again to buy the product again or, or whatever. So the store, you need to have that combination of both. And since we've gone back to that, it's funny, I started there and then I, I listened to a lot of people and I, I, I was like, oh, this works. And then I started building my own framework. Actually, the first version of my book said that, said, don't build a store. And then we learned long term and with the data and everything else, we're like, you know what? You want to build a real profitable brand? You need to have both. Yeah. Okay. What I'm learning through this is like own your data. Awesome. So that's, yeah. So that would actually help you build your store and build your brand itself. You don't have to rely on anybody else. This is a tough one. Usually people say it, so you can take your time. Mm -hmm. What have you recently changed your mind about? These are very similar questions and mm -hmm. I just try to learn from what you think differently because that helps a lot of people where they are questioning as well and you say it so yeah i would say it and, and for us a recent change specifically has been in how i approach our our marketing to cold audiences um, mm -hmm. and, and it's not not a specific thing it's more of a, a general but i have 
always kind of been on the not I, I believe in the you know attention interest and desire and talking about the problem and then agitating it and then you know all of that in my sales copy but when I make videos and everything else I've always like I feel I always felt that people are already in their pain so I, I don't need to take to be to do that I can just talk about say hey your problem is your store doesn't convert and then here's here's the solution ecom insider bill grow scale whatever and very much on what we can do to help them because and then the the problem with that though and that the change that's happened is i've learned that yes people are in their pain but a lot of times they don't even know what the true problem of their pain is and for me to be able to connect with someone they need to under, they need to know that i actually understand the problems that i've been there that i've shared the pain and as a leader, if you're going to lead somebody, and in our case, like I'm leading you into one of our programs where we're going to help you and you want to follow me, you have to first know that I've been where you've been, that I understand where you're at, and that I, I can't lead someone from somewhere I haven't been or I haven't dealt with. So in our marketing, we've changed, we're changing that to talk a lot more about, hey, here's what the problems are. Here, and you know what? Yeah, when your store doesn't convert, it's not just that your store doesn't convert. Well, when your store doesn't convert, you're not making money. And when you're not making money, your stress levels are through the roof and you're, you don't, you're not sleeping, you're eating, you don't go to the gym anymore, you, you start eating crap, emotional eating and you're, you're, you're butting heads with your wife and you're not, you're not nice to your kids. Like, I've been there. I've done all those things. And like, I understand that this one problem up here is actually much bigger. But, you know, I've, I've, this is where it's at. And then you can t talk about here's the possibility of how we can get out of that, and then here's here's the path, right? If I don't, but and I I was very opposed to this for a long time because I didn't want to like f make people feel. And honestly, I didn't want to feel it myself because I like even just saying it right now, like I started feeling what it was like again. And I, I mean, but I if, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna help people and we're going to help people and we do help people then I need to make sure that we, we can communicate that and actually let people know that. So I, the big change is that I believe it is very, very important to talk about the problems and the pain more so than anything else that we have, possibility, path, any of that stuff. It's just, mm -hmm. and I think that's super important. So what you, if, I'm, if I rephrase it, you're saying that you're not targeting somebody with awareness, interest, desire, and then retargeting them and showing them like their different ads. You're saying directly one pain, and although it seems like very guru-y, it still resonates with your audience to help them out. And that's something you've changed. So what you're saying is that you are able to convert people in the first session by telling them about their pain on Facebook ads, correct? Correct. That, and, you know, it's like the saying goes, you know, nobody cares what you sell until they know how much you care, right? They, so they need to, and they need to know that, like, the, the, that you're real. And they, they may not convert on the first thing, but the there's a smaller audience that is that is has the high awareness that is ready to hear just the top level and then buy than an audience that needs to be like related to and warmed up and and shown that hey yeah because it, it may polarize people which is totally fine too they may listen to it and they're like you know what nope okay good then we, we got that out of the way early on we saved my time we saved your time and we didn't you know take it too far okay yeah, got it one was when did you say something why not do something? The why not that probably was the biggest why not decision of my life was partnering with Matt. Because okay. it was, we were, we were working together on one brand, but I had BGS and he had his own thing. And then we, were, we just kept working more and more together. And we were like, maybe he's like, maybe we should just be actually together and like as a partners. And I had just gotten out of a, a not awesome partnership prior. So I was very gun shy, but after working in the trenches together like that um, for so long up and down with the kitchen brain, we kind of really got to know each other. And I was like, yeah, okay, why not? And I, I think that's literally the words that were said. So, and then the rest is history. Yeah. And that must be the best decision of your life.